Hello and welcome to another edition of uh, Data Central. What we're going to be talking about this first part of this episode is emphysema. And the information I'm going to be giving to you right now comes from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, let's learn a little bit about emphysema. And you can find this on the internet or you can go to your local library and pick up information about it. Emphysema is spelled E-M-P-H-Y-S-E-M-A. Emphysema. Now, let's look at an overview of emphysema. Emphysema is a lung condition that causes shortness of breath. In people with uh, emphysema, the air sacs in the lungs, the alveoli they're called, are damaged. Over time, the inner walls of the air sacs weaken and rupture, creating small, larger air spaces instead of many small ones. This reduces the surface area of the lungs and in turn the amount of oxygen that reaches your bloodstream. When you exhale, the damaged alveoli don't work properly and old air becomes trapped, leaving no room for fresh, oxygen-rich air to enter. Most people with emphysema also have chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is inflammation of the tubes that carry air to your lungs, the bronchial tubes, which leads to a persistent cough. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are two conditions that make up chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Smoking is the leading cause of COPD. Treatment may slow the progression of COPD, but unfortunately, it can't reverse the damage. The symptoms of emphysema. You can have emphysema for many years without noticing any signs or symptoms. The main symptom of emphysema is shortness of breath, which usually begins gradually. You may start avoiding activities that cause you to be short of breath, so the symptom doesn't become a problem until it starts interfering with your daily tasks. Emphysema eventually causes shortness of breath even while you're at rest. Now, when would you go see a doctor? Well, see your doctor if you've had unexplained shortness of breath for several months, especially if it's getting worse or it's interfering with your daily activities. And hey, you should go see your doctor often, anyway. But don't ignore it by telling yourself that because you're aging or out of shape that this is going on, seek immediate medical attention for these points. You're so short of breath, you can't climb stairs. Your lips or fingernails turn blue or gray with exertion. Number three, you're not mentally alert. Now, some of the causes of emphysema is long-term exposure to airborne irritants including tobacco smoke, marijuana smoke, air pollution, chemicals, fumes, and dust. And imagine you have exposure to more than one of these at a time, over a long period of time. Rarely, emphysema is caused by an inherited, an inherited deficiency of a protein that protects the elastic structures in the lungs. It's called alpha-1 antirypsin deficiency emphysema. What are the risk factors? Factors that increase your risk of developing emphysema include smoking. Emphysema is most likely to develop in cigarette smokers, but cigar and pipe smokers are also susceptible. The risk for all types of smokers increases with the numbers of years and the amount of tobacco smoked. Age. Although the lung damage that occurs in emphysema develops gradually, most people with tobacco-related emphysema begin to experience symptoms of the disease between 40 and 60. Exposure to secondhand smoke is also a factor. Secondhand smoke, also known as passive or environmental tobacco smoke, is smoke that you inadvertently inhale from someone else's cigarette, their pipe, or their cigar. Being around secondhand smoke increases your risk of emphysema. Occupational exposure to dust or fumes. If you breathe fumes from certain chemicals or dust from grain, cotton, wood, or mining products, you're more likely to develop emphysema. The risk is even greater if you smoke. Now you have the combinations, right? Exposure to indoor and outdoor pollution. Breathing indoor pollutants, such as fumes from heating fuel, as well as outdoor pollutants, car exhaust, for, existen for instance, increases your risk of emphysema. Now, complications. People who have emphysema are most likely to develop collapsed lung, which is called a pneumothorax. 
A collapsed lung can be life-threatening in people who have severe emphysema because the function of their lungs is already so compromised. This is uncommon, but serious when it occurs. Heart problems. Emphysema can increase the pressure in the arteries that connect the heart and lungs. This can cause a condition called core pulmonale, core pulmonale, in which a section of the heart expands and weakens. Large holes in the lungs can also occur as a complication. These are called bullae. Some people with emphysema develop empty spaces in the lungs called bullae that can be as large as half the lung. In addition to reducing the amount of space available for the lung to expand, giant bullae can increase your risk of pneumothorax. Now prevention. To prevent emphysema, don't smoke. And avoid breathing secondhand smoke. Wear a mask to protect your lungs if you work with chemical fumes or dust. Be happy, be healthy. Hey, we're gonna take a break now, we're gonna see a public service announcement and we'll be back with another portion of Data Central. Thank you. Michigan is home to talented people with a wealth of skills, the same ones explored by thousands of kids in 4-H. Share your gifts and help turn dreams into reality. Because life's little questions aren't meant to be answered alone. Welcome back to another portion of Data Central. This is Alfred Brock. We're gonna be talking briefly about chronic kidney disease. First, we're gonna take a look at the overview. Chronic kidney disease, also called chronic kidney failure, describes a gradual loss of kidney function. Your kidneys filter wastes and excess fluids from your blood, which are then excreted in your urine. When chronic kidney disease reaches an advanced stage, Dangerous levels of fluid, electrolytes, and wastes can build up in your body. In the early stages of chronic kidney disease, you may have few signs or symptoms. Chronic kidney disease may not become apparent until your kidney function is significantly impaired. Treatment for chronic kidney disease focuses on slowing the progression of the kidney damage, usually by controlling the underlying cause. Chronic kidney disease can progress to end-stage kidney failure, which is fatal without artificial filtering, which is called dialysis or a kidney transplant. Let's uh, look at the symptoms. The signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease develop over time if kidney damage progresses slowly. Signs and symptoms of kidney disease may include nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, fatigue and weakness, sleep problems, changes in how much you urinate, decreased mental sharpness, muscle twitches and cramps, swelling of feet and ankles, persistent itching, chest pain, if fluid builds up around the lining of the heart, shortness of breath, if fluid builds up in the lungs, high blood pressure, hypertension, then that's difficult to control. Signs and symptoms of kidney disease are often nonspecific, meaning you can, they can also be caused by other illnesses. Because your kidneys are highly adaptable and able to compensate for lost function, signs and symptoms may not appear until irreversible damage has occurred. Now, when should you see a doctor? In my opinion, you should see a doctor all the time. They're the greatest. Get their opinion and follow their advice and uh, work through that. Make an appointment with your doctor if you have any signs or symptoms of kidney disease. If you have a medical condition that increases your risk of kidney disease, your doctor is likely to monitor your blood pressure and kidney function with urine and blood tests during regular office visits. Ask your doctor whether these tests are necessary for you. Now, what are the causes for this? Chronic kidney disease occurs when a disease or condition impairs kidney function, causing kidney damage to worsen over several months or years. Diseases and conditions that can cause chronic kidney disease include type 1 or type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, glomerulophritis, which is an inflammation of the kidney's filtering units, the glomeruli. So the glomerulonephritis is an inflammation of the kidney's filtering units. Intestinal nephritis is an inflammation of the kidney's tubules and surrounding structures. Polycystic kidney disease, prolonged obstruction of the urinary tract from conditions such as an enlarged prostate, kidney stones, and some cancers. Vesicoureteral reflux, a condition that causes urine to back up into the kidneys. Recurrent kidney infection, also called uh, pyelonephritis. Now, what are risk factors? Factors that may increase, uh, increase your risk of chronic kidney disease include diabetes, high blood pressure, 
heat, heart, and blood vessel uh, cardiovascular disease, smoking, obesity, being African American, Native American, or Asian American, a family history of kidney disease, abnormal kidney structure, older age. What are the complications? Well, chronic kidney disease can affect almost every part of your body. Potential complications may include fluid retention, which could lead to swelling in your arms and legs, high blood pressure, or fluid in your lungs, which is called pulmonary edema. Uh, you could uh, have a sudden rise in potassium levels in your blood, which is uh, hyperkalemia, which could impair your heart's ability to function and may be life-threatening. Heart and blood vessel disease, that's cardiovascular disease. Weak bones and an increased risk of bone fractures. Anemia, decreased sex drive, erectile dysfunction, or reduced fertility. Damage to your central nervous system, which can cause difficulty concentrating, personality changes, or seizures. A decreased immune response, which makes you more vulnerable to infection. Pericarditis, an inflammation of the sac-like membrane that envelopes your heart, the pericardium. Pregnancy complications that carry risks for the mother and the developing fetus. And finally, or amongst them, irreversible damage to your kidneys, end-stage kidney disease, eventually requiring either dialysis or a kidney transplant for survival. A prevention, what can you do? To reduce your risk of developing kidney disease, follow instructions on over-the-counter medications. When using non-prescription pain relievers such as aspirin, ibuprofen, that is Advil, Motrin, IB, and others, and acetaminophen, Tylenol, and others, follow the instructions on the package. Taking too many pain relievers could lead to kidney damage and generally should be avoided if you have kidney disease. Ask your doctor whether these drugs are safe for you. Maintain a healthy weight. If you're at a healthy weight, work to maintain it by being physically active most days of the week. If you need to lose weight, talk with your doctor about strategies for healthy weight loss. Often, this involves increasing daily physical activity and reducing calories. Don't smoke. Cigarette smoking can damage your kidneys and make existing kidney damage worse. If you're a smoker, talk to your doctor about strategies for quitting smoking. Support groups, counseling, and medications can all help you to stop. Finally, manage your medical conditions with your doctor's help. If you have diseases or conditions that increase your risk of kidney disease, work with your doctor to control them. Ask your doctor about tests to look for signs of kidney damage. And that's what we have today for information on uh, kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease. And that came uh, to us from the, the Mayo Clinic. You can find it online. And be happy, be healthy. We've got another public service announcement for you coming up right now. Thank you. Michigan is home to talented people with a wealth of skills, knowledge, and expertise. Thousands of young people in 4-H are striving to develop their own gifts. Help turn these 4-H dreams into reality. Give your time and talents to lend a hand, provide guidance, and answer little questions along the way. What better gift can you give them and yourself? Become a 4-H volunteer today. Because life's little questions aren't meant to be answered alone. Hi, right, welcome back to Data Central. This will be the uh, third section today. Then this is our the end of our local section. Then we'll do something with the state and, and national briefly. I'm going to talk about obesity. Uh, obesity is a complex disorder involving an excessive amount of body fat. Obesity isn't just a cosmetic concern. It increases your risk of diseases and health problems such as heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Being extremely obese means you're especially likely to have both health problems related to your weight, uh, help, uh, likely to have health problems related to your weight. The good news is that even modest weight loss can improve or prevent the health problems associated with obesity. Dietary changes, increased physical activity, and behavior changes can help you lose weight. Prescription medications and weight loss surgery are additional options for treating obesity. Now, symptoms. Obesity is a diagnosis when your body mass index, the BMI, is 30 or higher. Your body mass index is calculated by dividing your weight in kilograms by your height in meters squared. So, there you go. If your BMI is below 18.5, that's underweight. If it's between 18.5 and 24.9, normal. Or, you know, or whatever. We won't say normal. Let's say normal for now. <laughs> 25 to 29.9, decline, described as overweight. 30 to 34.9, so obese class one. 35 to 39.9, obese class two. 
and 40 or higher extreme obesity class 3. For most people, BMI provides a reasonable estimate of body fat. However, BMI doesn't directly measure body fat, so some people, such as muscular athletes, uh, may have a BMI in the obese category, even though they don't have excessive body fat. So ask your doctor, have a conversation with your doctor, and ask them if your BMI is a problem. Now, when do you see a doctor? If you think you may be obese, and especially if you're concerned about weight-related health problems, see your doctor or health care provider. You and your provider can evaluate your health risks and discuss your weight loss, weight loss options. Now, causes. What are the causes of obesity? Well, there are some, there's some genetic and behavioral and hormonal influences of body weight. Obesity occurs when you take in more calories than you burn through exercise and normally da normal daily activities. Your body stores these excess calories as fat. Now, obesity can sometimes be traced to a medical cause, such as Prader-Willi's syndrome, Cushing's syndrome, and other diseases and conditions. However, these disorders are rare, and in general, the principal causes of obesity are 1. Inactivity. If you're not very active and you don't burn as many calories, with a sedentary lifestyle, you can easily take in more calories in every day than you use through exercise and normal daily uh, activities. Number 2. Unhealthy diet and eating habits. Weight gain is inevitable if you regularly eat more calories than you burn. And most Americans' diets are too high in calories and are full of fast food and high-calorie beverages. And it's not easy to get some of these foods if you're on in a go and you got to go to the fast food restaurants or you've come to use the, the restaurants themselves. Choose a healthy restaurant or choose a restaurant that's providing healthy meals and you're going to go a little further. Uh, with keeping obesity down. Now, what are the risk factors? Obesity usually results from a combination of causes and contributing factors, including genetics, while your genes may affect the amount of body fat you store and where that fat is distributed. Genetics may also play a role in how efficiently your body converts food into energy and how your body burns calories during the exercise. Another risk factor is family lifestyle. Obesity tends to run in families. Well, if one or both of your parents are obese, your risk of being obese is increased. That's not just because of genetics. Family members tend to share similar eating and activity habits. So inactivity. If you're not very active, you can't burn as many calories. With a sedentary lifestyle, you can easily take in more calories every day than you burn through exercise and routine daily activities, as we noticed. Having medical problems such as arthritis can lead to decreased activities, which contributes to weight gain. So we've got to look at all these things that are going on. A healthy diet. A diet that's high in calories, lacking in fruits and vegetables, full of fast food and laden with high calorie beverages and oversized portions contributes to weight gain. Medical problems. In some people, obesity can be traced to a medical cause such as Prader-Willi syndrome, Cushing syndrome and other conditions. Medical problems such as arthritis can also lead to decreased activity which may result in weight gain. Now, certain medications can have an impact. Research, uh, some. Uh, if you don't compensate through diet or activity, these medications can uh, um, increase obesity. These include some antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, diabetes medications, antipsychotic medications, steroids, and beta blockers. And there's social and economic issues. Research has linked social and economic factors to obesity. Avoiding obesity is difficult if you don't have safe areas to exercise. Similarly, you may not have been taught healthy ways of cooking, or you may not have money to buy healthier foods. In addition, the people you spend time with may influence your weight. You're more likely to become obese if you have obese friends or relatives. Age. Now, obesity can occur at any age, even in young children. But as you age, hormonal changes in a less active lifestyle increase your risk of obesity. In addition, the amount of muscle in your body tends to decrease with age. The lower muscle mass leads to a decrease in, in metabolism. And these changes also reduce calorie needs and can make it harder to keep off excess weight. If you don't consciously control what you eat and become more physically active as you age, you'll likely gain weight. Pregnancy. During pregnancy, a woman's weight necessarily increases. Some women find this weight difficult to lose after the baby is born. This weight gain may contribute to the development of obesity in women. Quitting smoking. Quitting smoking is often associated with weight gain, and for some, it can lead to enough weight gain that the person becomes obese. In the long run, however, quitting smoking is still a greater benefit to your health than continuing to smoke. So don't smoke. Talk to your doctor. Lack of sleep. Not getting enough sleep or getting too much sleep can cause changes in hormones that increase your appetite. You may also crave foods high in calories and carbohydrates, which can contribute to weight gain. Now, even if you have one or more of these risk factors... It doesn't mean that you're destined to become obese. You can counteract most risk factors through diet, 
physical activity and exercises along with behavior changes. Come on, get out, enjoy the place, enjoy yourself. Complications. If you're obese, you're more likely to develop a number of potentially serious health problems, including high triglycerides and low density lipoprotein, HDL cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, watch out for that, high blood pressure, watch out for that, metabolic syndrome, a combination of high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, and low HDL cholesterol, all at the same time. That's not nice. Heart disease, stroke, Cancer, including cancer of the uterus, cervix, endometrium, ovaries, breast, colon, rectum, esophagus, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, kidney, and prostate. Breathing disorders, including sleep apnea, potentially serious sleep disorder in which breathing repeatedly starts, stops, and starts. Gallbladder disease, gynecological problems such as infertility and irregular periods, erectile dysfunction and sexual health issues, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a condition in which fat builds up in the liver and can cause inflammation or scarring. And finally, osteoarthritis for this list that we have here. A quality of life. When you're obese, your overall quality of life may be diminished. It may be. You may not be able to do things you used to do that you want to do, such as participating in enjoyable activities that you got things out of. Hey, you may avoid public places. Obese people may even encounter discrimination. Terrible. Other weight-related issues that may affect your quality of life include depression, disability, sexual problems, shame and guilt, social isolation, lower work achievement. Yikes, it's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Now, prevention. Whether you're at risk of becoming obese, currently overweight, or at a healthy weight, you can take steps to prevent unhealthy weight gain and related health problems. Not surprisingly, the steps to prevent weight gain are the same as the steps to lose weight. Daily exercises, a healthy diet, and a long-term commitment to watch what you eat and drink. So exercise regularly. You need to get 150 to 300 minutes of moderately intense activity a week to prevent weight gain. Moderately intense physical activities include fast walking and swimming. Follow a healthy eating plan. Focus on low-calorie, nutrient-dense foods such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Avoid saturated fat and limit sweets and alcohol. Eat three regular meals a day with limited snacking. You can still enjoy small amounts of high-fat, high-calorie food as an infrequent treat. Just be sure to choose foods that promote a healthy weight and good health most of the time. Know and avoid the food traps that cause you to eat. Identify situations that trigger out-of-control eating. Try keeping a journal and write down what you eat, how much you eat, when you eat, how you're feeling, and how hungry you are. After a while, you should see patterns emerge. You can plan ahead and develop strategies for handling these types of situations and stay in control of your eating behaviors. Monitor your weight regularly. People who weigh themselves at least once a week are more successful in keeping off excess pounds. Monitoring your weight can tell you whether your efforts are working and can help you detect small weight gains before they become big problems. Be consistent. Stick into your healthy weight plan during the week or on the weekends and amidst vacation and holidays as much as possible increases your chances of long-term success. You can have lots of fun. There's lots of things to do in the holidays. You can go to the beach. If you're not at the beach, you can go to the mountains, go to the hills, walk around the block, say hello to somebody. It's all good. All right. We'll be back uh, right after this um, public safety, uh, public uh, service announcement. And we'll finish up with the state and national items. 4 Hers in your community need you. No matter your availability, there's a 4-H volunteer opportunity waiting for you. Because life's little questions aren't meant to be answered alone. Okay, for our statewide information, we're going to talk about when to start seeds indoors in Michigan. In January, seeds of perennial and biennial uh, flowers, herbs, and vegetables like artichokes would be good to start in January. So January just passed. Here's February. We can go with some onions. Leeks, celery, parsley, begonias, impatiens, coleus, geraniums, petunias, pansies, and viola seeds. So you got for, for the eaten, the onions, the leeks, the celery, and the parsley. That parsley would be above ground. The onions in the ground, the leeks in the ground, and the celery. Um, I think we're going to go with that in my local little garden here. And of course, uh, the begonias, uh, the larger uh, flowers, and the impatiens, coleus, geraniums, if you work with those, the petunias. The pansies, viola seeds, you can start them now so that when the spring comes on, you can get them out. And then next next month, we're looking also at uh, uh, some more some more flowers. Celosia, marigold, snapdragons, and salvia. So last month, it was seeds of perennial and biennial flowers, uh, along with the herbs, which are always great to grow inside. Love doing that. We're going to have a special program just about that. And the vegetables, including uh, the artichokes. And in mid-February, that's now. A couple weeks from now, get ready. If you're into the vegetables, onions, leeks, celery, 
and then the parsley is a good one. It makes a nice plant inside too, all the time. Makes a nice plant inside too, all the time. And then early March, uh, we'll have some more uh, time for uh, flowers. Now, let's talk briefly, national news, decline of manufacturing. Now, many have complained about the decline of manufacturing sector in the United States, and we've seen it all uh, happening all across the country. And there's a graph that they have that the Federal Bank of St. Louis shows that the, the, the decline started, it depends on where you look at where the decline started. If you look at the number of people employed in a sector, the decline started a decade ago. If you look at the share of manufacturing and total employment, the steady decline has been going on for decades. So we're seeing now in the past decade, another way to look at it is the decline has been going on for a long time. And in the past 10 years, it's taken a steep dive. So that's what's going on right now. The way to counteract it, if you're into manufacturing, find yourself a job in manufacturing. If you have something to invent and you want to make it, find business associates that can work with you, get the support you need. And it all sounds so simple when I'm saying it, but you know what? It is that simple. You can do it. Uh, you can compete and you can win. So that's what's going on now. Thank you so much for attending today. And we got one last public service announcement. And have a great week. Be healthy. Be happy. Bye-bye.